So we are considering the localization of uh, eigenvectors of random matrices, and we will concentrate on one concrete type of uh, delocalization, namely no gaps delocalization. And before I formulate it, let me say which uh, classes of matrices we will consider. We are striving to the uh, maximally general formulation so that uh, the structure wouldn't matter. And we assume that the entries of the matrix are uh, uh, almost independent except uh, that the entry AIJ can depend on AJI. This uh, would include in our class the full I, uh, independent matrices, the Hermitian matrices, Q Hermitian matrices, etc. The second uh, assumption was that the real part of the matrix is random and the imaginary part is fixed. This looks somewhat artificial, but the aim was also to include the real matrices where the imaginary part is just zero, or complex matrices where the real and imaginary parts are independent, and then you can condition on the imaginary part and reduce it to this model. And then we want to prove that any unit eigenvector of a matrix carries a non-negligible mass on any reasonably large set. If you take uh, epsilon to be small and you take any subset of coordinates, then these coordinates carry a mass which is polynomial in epsilon. So our uh, we are going to uh, discuss uh, uh, to show that this delocalization event is likely, and there are two different formulations of it. One, that if the entries have a uniformly bounded density, then this event is very likely so that the probability of the failure is exponential in a epsilon n, as can be any positive parameter, plus the probability, sorry, minus the probability that the norm of the matrix is large, and uh, this event is, has a very small probability if, say, the fourth moments of the entries are uniformly bounded. So this is a, a relatively easy statement, and uh, if we drop the uniform bounded density assumption, it turns out that we can prove essentially the same for general entries, only they have to be random, and uh, the only thing we require that they are not contained in small disks, otherwise the matrix would be almost deterministic. And then the conclusion is the same, that the localization event is likely if epsilon is uh, at least some uh, power of n. And one of the message, uh, main messages of this lecture series is that uh, using geometry along with probability, one can get uh, sometime more than with probability alone. So we want to uh, eliminate all the traces of the fact that we are dealing with the eigenvector and reformulated the problem so that it would be approachable geometrically. So here I rewrote the definition of the delocalization event. And we proved that we can reduce delocalization to uh, the uniform bound of the singular values of the matrix A minus lambda for any deterministic lambda. So if we manage to prove such a bound, then we have that we show that the pro we have shown that the probability of the delocalization event is likely 
we have to multiply this probability by the binomial coefficient, which is responsible for the number of such sets, and uh, some term, some discretization term, which is harmless. Uh, this is not, uh, not of the order of the first term. So we have to bound the smallest singular value uniformly, and we approached this also from geometric point of view, uh, trying to use the epsilon net argument described in the lectures of Tao. So I take the minimal singular value of, say, the matrix A tilde is the minimum uh, over the norm of x being one of the norm of A tilde x. And uh, discretize the sphere and uh, evaluate this minimal uh, for each point separately. This ended up in complete fiasco. It cannot work for any model of random matrices. And there are many reasons. But one thing to take home from this fiasco is that we need uh, P0 to, uh, to be sufficiently small to suppress this binomial coefficient. And this binomial coefficient, by Stirling formula, is about the exponential of epsilon n log e epsilon n, which means that it is super exponential in epsilon n. So our aim, if we wish to prove something using this method, we are bound to, uh, to uh, we have to find super exponential bounds for the minimal singular values. But that mean that means that we have to solve an easier problem, getting the super exponential bounds for the norm of a tilde x for a fixed x. And here, a tilde will be a minus lambda i. See. So for uh, uh, this, uh, this lecture, I will step away from random matrices. And we will discuss how to obtain strong small probability, a small ball probability bounds for random vectors. So let, say, x in Rn be a vector with independent coordinates. And we are going to, uh, and let P or N to Rn be a projection. And we need Uh, to show that the probability that the norm of Px to norm is small is also small. This uh, turns out to be a, a very difficult problem if uh, the, uh, the coordinates of x have general distribution, what arises there is the arithmetic structure of uh, the kernel of this projection p. And uh, handling it is a rather non-trivial task. But there is a particular case where everything is simple. And we are going to discuss this case, namely, 
will assume that entries of x have a bounded density. So if uh, the density of xj does not exceed some number k, then the density of the vector x, xj uh, x, does not exceed. This is a product of density, so it doesn't exceed k to the n. And if P is coordinate projection, then the marginal will be also a product of independent random variables. So the density of uh, Px so of y does not exceed k to the d, where d is the rank of p. And we want to, and it's plausible to, that the same uh, inequality would hold if we consider not only coordinate projections, but any projection of a rank d. Uh, let's consider the simplest possible case, d equals 1. So I consider a rank 1 projection, which is the, just the inner product which, uh, with uh, some vector. Uh, where the norm of this vector is 1. Okay, if it's the inner product, this is the sum j from 1 to n a j x j. So this is a linear combination of independent random variables. Nothing can be easier than that. And if uh, the densities of uh, the variables are uniformly bounded, then obviously the density of a linear combination should be bounded. And I heard this statement quite a few times, uh, and it's indeed obvious until you ask yourself a question why it is obvious. And then you start searching the literature. and. Uh, turns out that it wasn't written anywhere, almost anywhere. Actually, one can uh, fill, uh, find uh, this statement combining two uh, theorems, but one has to dig in an unexpected place, not in probability, but in geometry. So for one dimension, this problem was considered by Ragozin in mid-70s, and he proved that the, uh, the density of the linear combination would be maximal if xj are uh, uniformly distributed in an interval. So now let's see what, what does it mean that xj's are uniformly distributed, say, on the interval negative 1, 1. If I assemble them in a vector, then 
uh, this uh, vector is uniformly distributed in the unit cube. Okay, now what is uh, the density, the maximal density of this linear combination? Let's translate everything back to the one-dimensional projection. It's the, the maximal density of the ma one-dimensional projection and the maximum of uh, f p x is uh, the maximal. Uh, l let me take not one one, but negative one half one half to make the volume of the cube one is the maximal area of the section of the unit cube. So you take an n-dimensional unit cube and you are uh, searching for the maximum for the volume of the maximal hyperplane section and uh, there is uh, a theorem of Keith Ball that this maximum, the maximal section has area not more than square root of 2. This may uh, look surprising if you draw a cube then the max, uh, intuitively the maximal section should be orthogonal to one of its diagonals. And this is not the case. Actually, in any dimension, the maximal section will be a two-dimensional diagonal multiplied by a coordinate subspace. So combining theorems of uh, Ragozin and Ball, we can solve uh, the one-dimensional case. Uh, uh, however, the theorem uh, of Ball is very delicate and the proof is complicated. It was later simplified significantly by Nazarov and Podkoritov, but it's still uh, quite an untrivial piece of work. So uh, if we are not shooting for an optimal constant, there is uh, a softer method of obtaining such estimates, and this is what we are going to discuss. So we are going to prove the, the following theorem, and it is also joined with Vershinim. So let x be a random x in our n. with independent coordinates such that the densities of each coordinate are uniformly bounded. Then for any projection P R N to R N of rank D, the maximal density 
of the projection is bounded by what we anticipated, a constant times k to a, to a power d, where c is an absolute constant. Uh, very recently, in 2017, uh, Lifshitz, uh, Pivovarov, and Paoris found an optimal constant C using also geometric methods, and it turned out that this is the same constant that we saw in uh, Ball's theorem. This is square root of 2. But we are not going to shoot for such precision. An absolute constant would be enough. Okay. So, before we prove this theorem in full generality, let's consider a one-dimensional case. This is the simplest possible one. And here, actually, the, there is uh, the method of proof was proposed by Nazarov and Ball, uh, who used Fourier transform, in a, uh, but their paper was never published, because, probably because they discovered that this method appeared before in the works of Halas. And if you read the, uh, the argument of Halas, it's precisely this. Uh, so d equals 1, this is Halas. Uh, only Halas considered discrete random variables, but if you adopt this uh, method for continuous random variables, you will get a proof. So what we are going to do, our random variable y, which is one dimensional projection, is the sum ajxj, where the norm of a is 1. And we want to find the maximal density of y. And let's consider two cases. One case is trivial. If one of the coordinates of aj, say the absolute value of aj, so there exists a j such that the absolute value of aj is greater than 1 half, then this is trivial because I can condition on all other variables and conditional density will be bounded. Then I integrate uh, over the other random variable and conditional density remains bounded as well. So this is triviality. And case two, the interesting case, is when for n in j, the absolute value of a j is less or equal than one half. And in this case, we will use characteristic functions. So we want, uh, first of all, uh, without loss of generality, I'll assume that k is 1. Ju just by scaling each coordinate, I can always do it. And we have to bound the maximal density, but instead we will bound Fy at 0. Uh, if we, uh, our method is shift invariant, and it will be shift invariant, then one point would be enough. And let me write Fy at 0 as 1 over 2 pi over r of phi y of t dt, where phi y of t is a characteristic function. 
I. Uh, y. T. This is the Fourier inversion formula. And the first question which comes to mind why we can use the Fourier inversion. Fourier inversion requires that the Fourier transform is an L1 function. In general, it's not. But this is not a real problem. If I add a small Gaussian noise to each coordinate, so I add an independent copy of a small normal variable, then on the language of characteristic functions, I multiply by the characteristic function of a Gaussian, which is Gaussian. So I will make it an L1 function. So let's assume from the very beginning that the characteristic function is L1, and then we can use the Fourier inversion formula. And th this is very convenient because y uh, our y is a combination of independent random variables. That's what the method of characteristic functions was created for. So this is the product j from 1 to n of the expectations of exponentials of i a j x i a j x j t okay so now I'm going to estimate the integral of this, and let's use Helder's inequality. Remember that A is a unit random vector, so the sum of A j squares is 1. And I'll use the uh, Helder inequality with exponents A j to the negative 2. So f y of 0 is less or equal than 1 over 2 pi. This is a harmless coefficient. Then the product j from 1 to n of the integral over r, absolute value of phi x j. Uh, th this is the characteristic function of a scaled copy of x j. So phi x j of a j t to the power a j to the negative 2 to the power a j squared. OK. So now I am down to estimating uh, d t, to estimating each of these integrals separately. And uh, if I call this integral inside by ij, then uh, changing uh, the variable and setting p to be a j to the negative 2, we have to estimate if I change the variables, we'll, we'll have p to the negative 3 halves integral over r of uh, absolute value of phi x of uh, t to the power p d t. No, oh, sorry. p to the neg negative one half. I ran too quickly. OK. So let's write it using Fubini's theorem, or sometimes it's called distribution function formula. It's p to the negative 3 halves integral over f from 0 to infinity of s to the power 
P minus one times the Lebesgue measure. Let me write it on the next blackboard. P, this is P to the negative three halves integral over uh, from zero to infinity of uh, S to the P minus one times the Lebesgue measure of the set of all T such that phi x, absolute value of phi x of t is greater or equal than s, uh, greater than s, uh, d s. This is just a uh, Fubini theorem, nothing more. Okay, now let's look at what we have here. And I see that if the characteristic function cannot be more than one, so I don't really have to integrate up to infinity, I am integrating up to one. And if we know the behavior of this measure, we would be done very quickly. So the central lemma which would allow us to produce this densi uh, density bound is that the measure of the set of all t such that the x of t is greater than s does not exceed uh, 2 pi over s squared for s in 0, say, 3 quarters and uh, a constant times square root of 1 minus s squared for s in three quarters, one. So the importance of, uh, of this is in the second line, as S approaches one, this measure should approach zero and we manage to quantify it. If we have this lemma, then the proof is a, a, an exercise in calculus. You just split this integral from zero to one as uh, from zero to three quarters and three quarters to one, and estimate each integral separately. For uh, the first one, you have uh, the power negative two, but then you multiply it by the power p minus one, so you have p minus three. And remember, we took care that aj uh, less than one half, so p, which is aj to negative square, is greater than four, the power is greater than one, the integral is harmless. And uh, on the second interval, it's also an exercise in calculus, if you change the variables accurately, you will see that 